We know that most of our professional lives is spent working with or relying on teams. But in the context of issues in crisis management, the stakes are often really high. So it's re worth revisiting what sets the groundwork for a good team experience. Take a moment to think about your best and your worst experiences, and no doubt you've had some of both. A lot of times what we don't think about is what makes good and bad teammates. Instead, we just put it down to people's intentions, when that's not necessarily the case at all. Being a good teammate is a skill that can and should be developed, just like the tangible skills and knowledge of the processes surrounding issues in crisis management. So let's start by thinking about what makes a good team member by looking at the core competencies. Of course we want competent team members, but there are two types of competency, technical and relational. And when we apply this to real world settings and trying to get jobs move up, there are a bunch of qualities that managers and hiring committees are looking for. There's a lot of good research that examines this phenomenon and lists some of the biggest qualities of good teammates from that research. So as we develop as team members, it's good to use this as a bit of a stock check for what kind of team members we are. So first, intellectual ability. Naturally, this is important, but specifically, this means that you can sort through all the information that you'll get in your positions, identify relevant information from different sources, figure out salient issues, connections, and so you're able to be analytic and creative. Second, a results orientation asks the question, can you work in line with the goals of the organization and actually work towards accomplishing them? Interpersonal skills, of course, make sense. After all, we are talking about working in teams, but this really refers to our ability to relate to the feelings and the needs of others, to be both sympathetic and empathetic. Next, planning and organizing. Asks a fundamental question, can you efficiently use the time you have when you're at work, especially in your team? Do you multitask? Are you often on multi multiple teams at once, and most importantly, can you meet the deadlines? A team orientation focuses very simply on people who can play well with others. Maturity asks the question, are you responsible? Can you handle pressure and deal with difficult, difficult situations and oftentimes difficult people? And finally, do you have presence? That is, can you create a positive first impression to stand out tactfully? In a lot of ways, this is asking, are you an effective verbal and nonverbal communicator? As we look at other factors that affect group interactions, there are also traits that people display that make them better or worse team members. We'll take a look at three of them. First, dogmatism. This refers to a commitment to fairly rigid belief structures. It doesn't necessarily have to be religious. It can be any belief structure. So people who are highly dogmatic are also likely to reject other people's ideas and even sometimes people who are different in some kind of meaningful way. Think about the kinds of effects that dogmatism has on group interactions. And also it's helpful to think about examples of dogmatic people people who are zealots and fanatics, people like, say, Katie Hopkins or Donald Trump and the like. These are folks who have, tend to have a hard time working well with others. Second, willingness to communicate is an important one in team interactions. Those who are less willing to communicate often report feeling a sense of social alienation from the rest of their groups. But it's important to think about why people may not be very willing to communicate in small groups. It might be that they're introverted, that they don't feel like they are very good at it, that is, they have low efficacy. They might be worried about creating conflict. They may even feel a lack of preparedness or just feel different. The good news about working in small groups is the more that people interact within a particular group, the more likely they are to feel comfortable and contribute more. And then third, argumentativeness. 
Argumentativeness tends to get a bit of a bad rap. What it is actually is someone who questions ideas, uh, presents their reasons for positions they're taking, offers analysis, and, and focuses on improving ideas, concepts, and plans. This is really in direct contrast to what a lot of times we think about when we he hear people say, oh, they're just so argumentative. What they typically mean is that they're very verbally aggressive because this focuses on people who attack people, not their arguments, and, and people who are, tend to be a bit more destructive with their disagreements, that they create conflict. Argumentativeness tends to be a positive trait. Of course, verbal aggressiveness is not. But another set of factors we th tend to think about in terms of affecting group interactions is group size. So as groups are very small, they're there are different kinds of problems that emerge. So there may not be enough ideas to stimulate interaction, especially if people don't know each other very well. Think about awkward first dates. The same is true as, as groups are new. It can also actually lead to more conflict that's less easily resolved because each person in the group has a higher stake. However, it can be easier to coordinate with smaller groups though. But as group size increases, what that means is that each member's opportunity for involvement decreases. And what can happen is that decreased levels of involvement can lead to lower levels of satisfaction. It also, big groups are a bit harder to lead and to manage a participative or quite democratic style of leadership. So a lot of times they end up being a bit more authoritarian. The best recommendation on group size is what's known as the least size principle, meaning use the smallest number of people to efficiently get the job done. Most research suggests that about four to six people tends to fit that bill in most situations. Of course, there's variance, but that tends to be a good rule of thumb. The third big factor that I want to talk about affecting group interactions are changes in membership. Changes in membership are typically uh, a given in most group interactions. If groups are short term, it may not be, but groups who are together long term certainly will feel changes. And there are four factors that influence changes in membership and what kind of an impact they'll have on a small group. First, the math of the change matters. So how many people are added or subtracted? Does the absolute size of the change, what's the proportion of new to old members? Each one of these can be a source of discomfort, but also relief, depending on the factors going along with it. Second, the reason for the change members. Was the change initiated by a single person? Did the whole group seek the change? Or was this imposed on the group by someone outside? Third, the timing of the change matters. Is this frequent? Does this typically happen in the group? If so, people tend to adapt. If it's a bit irregular, then people, it can throw the group off a little bit more. So for example, a routine election of new leadership typically doesn't upset the group. However, if the group changes because someone's been tossed out, of course it does. And then finally, of course, who changes matters in terms of the centrality of the person's role or even skills brought in by other group team members. So as we think about the factors that affect group interactions, we also need to take a look at the stages of group formation. If we start to understand the nature of productive and not so productive members, qualities and traits, we should also take a look at the stages of group formation because these place different kinds of stressors on groups as well. In crisis contexts, we don't always have the luxury of a calm and easy process of forming a group, but groups of all kinds tend to go through this process, sometimes very quickly, sometimes very slowly. So let's take a look at each of the stages. First, in stage one, there are three primary concerns. Some of these might be defined for you. Sometimes group members define them. 
but a lot of this will depend on the external or internal locus of control that is the origin of the group. So the first concern is inclusion. This is simply, do I feel like a member of the group? Am I a member of the group? Second are boundaries. Boundaries are important for groups to establish who's on the inside, and oftentimes this comes by defining who doesn't get to play with us, so who's not a member of the group. And third, dependency. How connected do we feel to each other, to the leader, to the other members in the group? In this stage, there is what we call primary tension. It's a bit of social unease. Everything is probably new, some people may know each other, some people may not. So the dependency question is one that's starting to get settled. It can cause a little bit of, of awkwardness early in the groups. Second, in the second stage, groups are almost entirely concerned with authority and really their ability to contribute to it. So if you're in this stage, you might ask the question, how can I influence the group? Here, you're still likely to be feeling a bit of primary tension, but you're also now very concerned about power, who has it, how they can exercise it, and whether or not that should be the case. So this is what's called secondary tension. Now, stage two can be a really vocal stage, but this is beneficial because people get the opportunities to define their contribution here. This stage also tends to set the tone for how the group work will be done from there. So when we think about all this silly group description that we, we talked about earlier, who does the work, all of those kinds of norms that emerge, this is the stage that really predicts how the work gets done. Now, one of the things that I've learned over time, both from research and experience, is that people who often get judged as bad group members aren't necessarily choosing to be. In some cases, this second stage is problematic. For example, if people don't feel like they have a meaningful opportunity to contribute, they just won't. They'll disengage. Now, if you're someone who tends to jump right in, one of the cautions is that you might be causing social loafing by not giving people an opportunity to contribute. And so vying for influence can actually act as a disincentive for others to participate. If you feel like you tend to err in that direction and, and you feel like you always get stuck with the work, try taking a softer approach in your next group. Hang back a little bit and see if others pick up the work. It may be that you have actual slackers, but most of the time people just want to feel like they can contribute and like they actually have a say. The third stage then is about relationship building proper relationship development where groups often start to get over that social anxiety and trying to look good for others and where we've started to resolve the power questions so you get some higher level concerns for trust especially about task accomplishment about confidence those kinds of things you also see concerns about structure here the norms and the rules start to get formalized and in the case where there are actual rules um, or implicit norms, there are certain patterns that start to get repeated. Some of the rest of the group members start to discourage, but some of them start to encourage by these kind of norms and structures. And certainly intimacy, that is how cohesive the group is. These are all three qualities that can be developed with care. For example, in long-term work groups, doing something social is a way to build trust and intimacy with colleagues. Now these are more complex and more personal kinds of relationships. When they're built, they can actually help groups to negotiate inevitable conflicts and strengthen people's comfort with sharing the workload. So stage three and getting to know each other is really important one. But then in stage four, um, if we think about this process of relationship development amongst our teams, then it's really in stage four that things start to get real. The first three stages have been kind of the dating and honeymoon phases. But in stage four, you start to realize that you're stuck with these people 
and you have particular tasks to accomplish. So stage four is all about productivity. You ask the question, can and how will we achieve our goals? So task-oriented role behaviors are likely to dominate in stage four. Fifth, at some point while the groups are getting on with the work, there will start to be questions about fairness and quality of work that naturally emerge. And these are characteristic of the fifth stage of team development. So by this point, you have groups that have typically gotten most of the power issues resolved and hopefully they're tripping along towards their goals. But group maintenance behaviors become more prevalent. So it's not just important that you're achieving your goal, but groups tend to be concerned about these two other things as well. Fairness, are others doing their fair share? And quality, are we doing something that's really worthwhile and are we actually doing it quite well? Then in our final stage, what now? The potential ending. Now, odds are that the goal has come due, that is you've either met it or not met it, um, but at the sixth stage, it's something where people in the groups themselves has to have to ask whether they continue working together, organizing in other ways, and in doing so, figure out how they feel about the experience as a whole. This doesn't mean that the group necessarily ends, but there tend to be decisions made about the group and its relative value. So if we put the qualities of group members together with the traits and the stages of group formation, we think about what roles that people enact while they're working in teams. If we ask the question, what's a role? We can think of it as any regularly performed behavior by group members and expected of group members. This means that someone's role doesn't necessarily have to be positive nor prescribed. The slacker is a legitimate role that someone can occupy. Likewise, the person who always brings the goodies is a role that can emerge. But it's simply a behavior that's repeated and expected. So when we think about roles and role-related behaviors a bit more systematically, there are three major types of role-related behaviors to talk about. First are task-related behaviors. If this is a role behavior you enact, you're likely to be managing information, managing the work of the group in some way. You might be trying to initiate discussion, seek information or opinions, evaluate ideas contributed by other group members, summaries, coordinating ideas, testing for consensus. All of these are task-related behaviors. Second are group maintenance behaviors. Here, you focus on the group's success as a group. You demonstrate a commitment to making sure that the group itself can function. So if you enact behaviors uh, that are group maintenance behaviors, you're likely to try and make sure that everyone has an opportunity to contribute to the discussion. You focus on the standards for the group process like attendance. Um, often people in this in these sets of behaviors try to harmonize or compromise. They encourage their team members. And sometimes they do some tension breakers with joking or even dramatizing. But they're really trying to make sure that the group can function together. But of course, we also have the third category, the process hindering behaviors. No matter what behaviors are demonstrated, these tend to be excessive behaviors because they reflect an I focus, not a group focus. So even task and group maintenance behaviors can end up being process hindering. But these often include things that block participation. So someone critiques an idea in, in such a harsh way that the other group members don't want to contribute or it becomes about the conflict itself. It might also be that people completely withdraw or they're focused with trying to get all the credit, trying to dominate, trying to plead for special interest uh, to the exclusion of wanting to compromise. Anything that really puts up a roadblock to getting on with the work that the group is trying to do. But in so doing this, like I alluded to, people start to and groups tend to begin to develop norms, team norms. 
So if we ask the question, what are norms? Very simply, they're the expectations for the behavior of all members while they're operating within the confines of the group. Are these rules? Some certainly can be, however, the vast majority of groups' norms are implicit. Think about if you've traveled internationally. If you have, and even if you knew the language, think about those moments where you felt awkward. Most of us have, have done. The same is true in groups. Um, if you enter a group that's already been established for a while, sometimes people will feel socially awkward. Uh, was it because you're violating a rule? Probably not. It was probably because you just didn't know all the ways that people just do things around here. In new organizational settings and certainly new teams, um, this is the case. As teams first form, they tend to form their own norms. So why do we care about norms? Well, after people are acquainted with or develop the norms, what they do is they increase people's comfort level because they know what to expect in the team or the organizational environment. Group culture, inside jokes, all of these things function to make us feel like we're at home, like we're comfortable and we belong in the group. A norm violations, however, are really interesting. In research on gangs, it felt that there are very strict codes of conduct, both explicit and implicit, and if a gang member violates them, they might be in mortal danger. Most groups that you're in obviously are unlikely to execute you for a norm violation, but there is probably going to be some kind of consequence. In groups, sometimes people that are seen to violate the norms on a regular basis Yet there may not be particular negative direct consequences. But a lot of times it can really be about how the group feels about the other person and whether the violation of the norm is an idiosyncrasy or something that's actually damaging to the group's well-being. So if we think about the violations of the norms, think about what's ex appropriate, expected, and what happens if you don't? Now, the notion of changing norms. A lot of times groups can get into good and bad habits. How do you, how do you break these or change these or improve these? A lot of times it can be quite difficult. And we have to answer the question, who can initiate the change? Even if you make a new rule about something, it can get very difficult for people to enact them. So... Factors that affect changing norms is people's desire for harmony, the, the tenure of the group, how long the group's been around, the newness of people, and even the, the influence of technology can all inform how difficult or easy it is to change the norms. Now, certainly there is a lot of research available on um, group development and group formation. These are a couple of good resources.